Hey guys, thanks for coming out here. This is the second part of what you need to know about food labeling. In this episode, I'm going to focus on technology in our food supply chain. In the third part, I'm going to talk about the low calorie sweeteners used today and their impact on our health. So much has happened in the last 10 years that on many of these sweeteners, we actually know how they are impacting our body. So if you have diabetes or metabolic syndrome or you're overweight, you're using these low calorie sweeteners, you are really going to want to watch part three. But for today, I'm going to take a deep dive into our GMO crops and some of the conversations happening right now in the U.S. And I've been researching our food supply for the last two years. And originally, I had wanted to do a quick one-part episode on five things I didn't know about our food supply chain. And as you can imagine, when you started getting into it, it was just overwhelming and it's taken me all this time to narrow down the things I didn't know about our food supply chain and get all the research because finding the research can be super difficult at times. So this is the second episode and it's going to highlight part of the technology and I wanted to share this information because this all came as a surprise to me. I didn't know about it and I'm going to try and show you both sides of the issue and you're going to have to make your own decision. You know, some of this, there isn't a decision to make. Instead, it's more about how can we work together to get through this? One of the things that's happening in agriculture is weed resistance. And you're going to say, well, that isn't anything new, but it is. Let me tell you about it. These are glyphosate resistant weeds or Roundup resistant weeds. I grew up in rural America and I remember the GMO technology promise. It was to increase crop yield so we could feed the world, control of weeds with less input, allowing one person to farm more acres and fewer herbicides, making them more environmentally friendly. In 2009, I was back in Minnesota and talked with some of these farmers. The new GMO seeds were so effective, they had stop crop rotation and most of the diversity and crop rotation that was part of farming when I grew up was no longer practice. Most of the farmers had specialized. This specialization came with a price, including migrating to Roundup Ready Weed Control, also known as glyphosate. So to get a feel for how much glyphosate we're talking about, there was a study done in 2016. It's called Trends in Glyphosate Herbicide Use in the United States and Globally. There's a link in the video description below. That study found that we increased our use of glyphosates by 15 times since 1995. So to get some pure numbers on this. In 1995, 17 million pounds of glyphosate herbicides. In 2016, it was 250 million pounds of glyphosate herbicides. So around this time, 2009, uh, when I was back in Minnesota, stories started coming out of Southern United States talking about these glyphosate resistant pigweed, water hemp. It wasn't going to take long. These glyphosate resistant super weeds would be everywhere. But why are these weeds so much more concerning? Unlike the weeds of our history, these weeds are aggressive. They're quick growing and they have the ability to destroy the whole crop in one season. In the video description below, you're going to find a link from Ag Web Editor and their video called Herbicide Resistant Palmer Amaranth. And that's one of those resistant weeds that we've been talking about. And in that video, though, you're going to hear from this farmer from Ohio talking about his neighbor who is trying to get rid of his glyphosate resistant weeds by spraying extra glyphosate. Even doing that, he still lost the whole field. And here's the thing. If you've ever been to the Midwest, a field is not 20 acres. Fields are like 150 to 500 acres. So to lose one of those fields is huge and a bit terrifying. 
So you can find a lot on weed resistance in videos on YouTube. And the first videos that come up are usually from the corporations. They have been really active about coming out and talking about these weeds because they are a risk to our farming and to our crop yield. So Bear Monsanto's position is this, weed resistance is natural and it's happened worldwide due to our industrialized farming practices. And this kind of changes in plants happens due to natural selection and natural selection is based on Darwin's principles that species will change to survive new environments. Farmers, they say, need to go back to some of the old diversifying methods before GMO seeds, while Bayer works on developing a new strain of seeds resistant to some of the older pesticides. On the other side of the coin, Monsanto encouraged farmers to use only their seed and herbicide, and this lack of biodiversity created the perfect storm for superweed creation. These weeds, they're not the weeds of the past. These weeds are aggressive and they're eliminating all the benefits of industrialized farming. These practices have fostered GMO weed resistance in the same way that taking antibiotics enabled antibiotic resistant superbugs. Okay, that's kind of scary. Um, okay, so penicillin. Let's talk about penicillin. Penicillin was introduced for widespread use around 1945. Do you know that by 1947, the first penicillin-resistant bacteria was identified? And the U.S. had their first case of MRSA in 1968. So it took 20 years to get to superbug. GMO foods were introduced into the human food supply in 1994, and the first resistant weeds were found in Mississippi in 2005. So that's about 20 years. And in another 10 years, they became these super weeds that could grow anywhere. So it comes down to how these weeds are changing farming practices today. The farms, they're really big today, and large farms depend on industrialized agriculture. So you're seeing farmers struggle trying to bring back methods used pre-GMO seeds and hoping to maintain yields of post-GMO fields. It reminds me of a quote from the author Thomas Mann. I stand between two worlds. I am at home in neither, and I suffer in consequence. As farmers struggle to straddle these two worlds of pre- and post-GMO seeds, the GMO-resistant weeds require an increase in the amount and types of herbicides, including going back to some of the more toxic herbicides. And you know what? These changes come with increased health risk. And what started me thinking about this was, you know, when I was back there in 2016, the field that surrounded the farmhouse was sprayed and I couldn't go out for three days. The air was so heavy with herbicide that I couldn't breathe. And what struck me was the health risk of being saturated in that much herbicide and nobody was talking about it. It was like this huge elephant in the room. So Back in the 80s, I was in California when pesticide use on farms was getting significant attention due to all the health hazards of pesticides. And I put a link below in the video description to a paper by an MD at that time, and it kind of summarizes what was going on. And the paper cites studies on cancer associated with herbicides and pesticide exposures. And it's almost every cancer from lymphoma to leukemia to testicular cancer to brain, lung, gastrointestinal cancer. The other thing that the paper states is that agriculture pesticide use is the major cause of contamination of groundwater. You know, the EPA used to publish the amount of pesticides being used in the U.S. They stopped publishing it, so, you know, I can't see what the trend is, yet the resources that I've been able to find suggest the amount of herbicides used has been increasing over the last 10 years. And it was a 2015 Harvard University article that talked to the increasing use of herbicides on GMO fields. And the article's called Why Roundup Ready Crops Have Lost Their Allure. Using USDA data, it estimated GMO crops have required an additional 383 million pounds of herbicides over non-GMO crops. 
Okay, so all super interesting. But this is what this was one of the aspects that I really didn't know. And one of the major complaints with Monsanto and their GMO seeds is they have not allowed independent research on their seeds. So Back in 2009, 26 academic entomologists wrote to the U.S. EPA that no truly independent research can be conducted on the many critical questions involving these crops. I bring it up because, again, I had no idea that we hadn't studied the safety of GMO crops. I just assumed that because they had been approved for human consumption, we had done long-term studies on critical health concerns. But these scientists were right. It's really difficult to find research on the safety of GMO products. And if there are studies, the vast majority of them are 90 days or less, which is too little time. Those studies that are longer than 90 days and are multi-generational document concerns that they think needs further research. But the scientists are not receiving government or industry funding to research a situation. So that means that the great majority of the information out there is anecdotal evidence. And that also means that there's no science out there that can really tell me if these products are safe. So with all that being said, what did I find? Um, there's a few things out there. So the Australian Food Safety Agency found a reduction in fertility in mice fed GMO feeds over successive generations. Now, you're going to find the links in the video description below to all these studies. Russia also found reduced fertility in hamsters over successive generations. And, wow, a higher mortality rate of the offspring in GMO-fed hamsters. Now, India reported the death of animals eating BT cotton. The, that was anecdotal, and this is an, anecdotal too to a certain degree. But in 2003, 20 Iowa farmers complained that feeding a BT corn to their livestock may have made them sterile. So the USDA looked into it and they looked at the feed and they were looking for a toxin and couldn't find one. But they never looked to see if it was the modification of the seeds making these animals infertile. So the other one that I found was a study on pigs fed GMO foods for two years, the lifespan of a commercial pig. And this was another one of those crazy interesting studies. So the GM diet was associated with gastric and uterine differences in pigs. GM, the GM fed pigs had uteruses that were 25% heavier than the non-GM fed pigs. So the GM fed pigs had a higher rate of severe stomach inflammation, 32% compared to 12% in non-GM fed pigs. And the severe stomach inflammation was even worse in the GM fed males compared to the non GM fed males. And that was by a factor of four. So four times more likely to get the severe stomach inflammation. And in females, it was two times more likely to get the severe stomach inflammation over non GM fed females. Okay, so you know, as you get older, you're, you just don't have the resources to survive some of the toxins that we have in our environment. I want to talk just two seconds about your senior cat or dog, because that pig study really kind of highlighted what myself and some of my friends have experienced with their senior cats and dogs. This doesn't replace any advice from your vet, but let's say your senior cat or dog starts losing weight and they refuse to eat their food. Check the food and make sure that it doesn't have any grain in it. If it has grain, go find food that doesn't have grain in it. And then what you can do to help them uh, rebuild their stomach is get food that has pumpkin in it. That seems to be really, really helpful. And again, make sure you talk to your vet first. And if they can't find any issues, then check out the food. There is not that much out there that supports GMOs either. I did find a review on fertility 
from the Shiraz University of Medical Sciences in Iran. And that university is supposed to be the top medical school in Iran. So I did go through and review what they were looking at. All the studies came out of China. Most of them were between seven to 90 days. And that's been, you know, the biggest complaint is within that time frame, you really can't identify if there is going to be a, a significant change. And so I kept on looking until I was able to find one study that was multi-generational, and it was three generations. They did find statistical differences in the rats that were fed the GMO crop. The thing was, is they said that they didn't consider the differences valid. There's another French study that identified concerns with GMO products fed rats, and This study was retracted when it was determined that the sample size was too small to allow for clear conclusions and the type of rat, which seems to be the type of rat that most people use, the Worcester rat, was known for a high incidence of tumors. Okay, so this just highlights the current difficulty of GMO research. It's either that the time frames are too small to note a difference, usually 7 to 90 days, or the information is anecdotal evidence and there's no funding to research the situation. So for me, is there a fertility issue with GMO crops? I really don't know. Is there a metabolic issue with GMO crops? I don't know. This information just really highlights the concern raised to the EPA from the 26 academic entomologists that no truly independent research can be legally conducted on the many critical issues or many critical questions involving these crops. And here's my thoughts. Until the consumer believes their concerns are being addressed and the company is transparent, they're going to continue to vote with their pocketbook, which is what I highlighted in my last video on food labeling part one, where Grocery Manufacturers Association rebranded itself to Consumer Brands Association to give more focus to the consumer. So things are changing, but the current rules of food labeling leave a lot of room for confusion. I think you need to have the ability to make accurate decisions on what you're eating, but we're not there yet. And definitely things are changing. So until we get labels that accurately reflect what we're eating, educating yourself is going to be the best way to make valid decisions for your health. You know, One drop of rain isn't significant, but one drop of rain in a rainstorm and over time created the Grand Canyon. So here's the thing. The body has a tremendous ability to regenerate. When we hit 50, our regeneration powers dim and things start showing up. And instead of being able to make those small changes, we have to make these large changes. Yeah. If you can understand what type of impact your choices may have in your body, you can start to figure out modifications which may improve your overall health without causing a great inconvenience. And if you start making these changes earlier in life, you have a much better chance of not having to do large changes later in life that my husband and I got stuck with. So, okay guys, until next time, I'll catch you on the other side.